North Idaho. I've never seen a moose up close. That's ridiculous. That's very cool. What's good? This is Chef David Olson with Live Fire Republic and I am stoked you are here with us today. We have landed at an absolute bucket list location. We set up camp here in Northern Idaho on the North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River and we have two super cool things we're gonna be sharing with you today. Uh, number one, we're doing my all time favorite spin fishing and we're chasing today after West Slope cutthroat trout. And I'll be doing that alongside my very good friend, Brian Klum from Klum Dog Outdoors. But undoubtedly today, because uh, today is uh, a catch and release cook, uh, we're gonna do for you guys probably the most adventurous, ambitious cook I've done anywhere ever and we're doing it here at camp. In fact, today what we're doing is we're preparing uh, these locally freshly harvested baby back ribs and we're doing it all over open fire. The most challenging cook you will see with ribs anywhere is happening here and you don't wanna miss this. It's time to get the fire started. Stay hungry, let's go. Now, before we get on the water, the first step is creating our fire. And as you can see here, we built a tall wall of riverbed rocks to surround our fire, and that's gonna help create an oven effect. Now, you'll also notice we have flat bed river rocks set atop the fire. They're warming. I'll get to that later in the video. Until then, let's get started on the ribs. The first step in our rib cook is removing the membrane from the bottom side of the ribs. Now, simply what you'll need is a butter knife, and some paper towel. Let's get into this. Now we're gonna use this butter knife and go directly underneath the membrane that exists on the bottom side of the rib rack, lift it up, and then use our paper towel to pull it off. Knife in. Now all you need is just a corner on this. And the reason you use paper towel is it allows you to better grip. There we go. And I'm just gonna grip and pull. Grip and pull. And keep moving your fingers underneath Let's see if we can get one. Sometimes you can get it off in one pull. Let's see if we can get it off. Here we go. Keep working around. Once you get the paper towel to start moving the membrane, there we go. Now I'm gonna come back and watch as I curl around and then lift through. And if we're lucky, we can get this all in one swoop. Here we go. Wow, look at we go. Continuing to turn as you move down the rib rack, keeping pressure on that membrane. And then, boom! Now that's the last time you're gonna use a butter knife in a cook like this. Next, have an incredibly sharp chef's knife or preparatory knife that you can use. And we just wanna trim off some of the loose ends and some of the little snippets of the ribs to even them up as much as possible. Even the best butchered ribs do come with some of these little end pieces. I recommend saving them. They're great for stock. They're great to place just over the grill for a few chef bites. We don't wanna get rid of too much of this fat, but just some of the loose ends, we're just gonna trim that up. I don't mind that there on the end. That's fine as well. Just hack off a little bit. Make sure we're just about even. I'll even pull off this piece down here. And again, these bits are just gonna get super crispy and burnt. It's gonna make the ribs uneven, and now this is exactly what we're looking for. A massive baby back rib, membrane removed. We look great on this side too. And a lot of this fat's actually gonna melt down. We might even carve off a portion of this over here before we get started. But otherwise, I think this looks good. All right, when you're 100 miles from anywhere, the goal is to keep it simple. So for these ribs, we're going to season them with a bit of olive oil, and we have a homemade barbecue rub that includes a little bit of brown sugar, some granulated honey, ancho chili, paprika, roasted garlic, black peppercorn, dried onion, mustard, and plenty of kosher salt. Now hitting the ribs with a bit of olive oil. Get them really good. This acts as a binder, but also a flavorizer. It's gonna really help that rub stick to these ribs throughout the cook. Now going in extra hard with the seasoning. 
This is gonna coat on the front and back side here of the ribs, and we're gonna get plenty of this seasoning on. Because of the way that we're gonna be grilling these ribs, I say it in almost every video that we do, you lose about 30 to 40% of your seasoning to the grill grate and the fire. This is a non-traditional open fire method of cooking. I wanna get an extra amount of seasoning on these ribs. The ribs are gonna sit for about five minutes, and what we're looking for is them to develop just a wetness and a bit of tack. Before they go on the fire though, I'm gonna rub them in just to ensure that all of those seasonings are hit down into those proteins and fat super well. Since I've been outlawed on this series from using the word moist, uh, I would say that we've developed a nice wet tack on portions of this rib. For the other portions that are not yet wet, we're just gonna give them a little bit of a rub. Just get in there. There we go. We wanna make sure that not an iota more than necessary of that rub leaves these rib racks. Now this is the exact tack that you're looking for before the ribs go on the grill. Now if I'm cooking at home in my backyard, I wanna make sure these ribs come up to room temperature. Room temperature out here uh, is about 30 degrees. Forget the wind, it's cold. That being said, we've let these set out. They're gonna require some extra cooking time today, but I'll show you how we'll mitigate that to ensure these are beautiful, tender, and delicious. Ribs on. Now these ribs are gonna cook for about four to six minutes per side. We're just looking to develop a really nice crust and a bit of char before we move on to the second stage, which is the braising. Now in a traditional rib cook, I'm seasoning these ribs, getting them in the smoker, and cooking them low and slow at about 225 degrees for hours. We don't have that luxury, frankly, <laughs> out here. We're doing open fire style of ribs. It's an entirely different method of cooking the ribs. We're gonna start with a sear directly over the fire, building a beautiful crust atop the pork. We're gonna flip to the bone side, repeat the process, and then wrap the ribs in a bit of apple cider vinegar, uh, any beer that we can find that's, uh, that's been left on hand from last night's camp out. Uh, and we're gonna wrap those in tin foil, set them down into the fire, and let them slowly braise, break down, and build an incredible bit of tenderness. You guys are gonna wanna see this. All right, it doesn't take long in this method of cooking. Look at the color we already have on the bottom side of those ribs. We might flip these here a few times just to ensure they're cooking evenly. All fires have warm spots and cool spots. Don't worry about a bit of the black here. Not a big deal, that's just some of the sugar is caramelizing. We'll work around that through the course of the cook. Now it's important to know where the hot and the cool spots are in your fire. On the front part of the cook, we have some spots that cook a little bit more, other spots that cook a little bit less. Parts that cook a little less will move that portion of the rib directly over the highest heat portion of the fire, give it some more attention to develop more evenness in that crust on the exterior of the ribs. Any portion that's not done in... <laughs> By the end of this cook, in this method, you're gonna see how it all evens out. It's gonna turn out incredible. You know, I think by the end of this cook, I'm gonna give you all a good reason to ditch your smokers and just uh, <laughs> get out here in the mountains with us and cook ribs. This is just about exactly what you're looking for. Now you saw them when we first flipped them, but we've had a process of continual movement over the fire. And the goal's been to build crust and caramelization across the entirety of the exterior of the rib surface. We're there, check these out. Ah, throw it in the fire, throw it in the fire. Man down, man down. There we go, those are money. Money ribs. We've just moved the ribs to the exterior portions of the fire. It's time to get our tin foil, wrap these ribs. In the bottom of that tin foil packet will be apple cider vinegar and the beer of Bushcraft Champions. Well, Coors Light. The first step in our process was the sear. The second step in our process is the braise. 
Now, just like you do when you're smoking ribs at home, we're gonna accomplish the same task here, but we're actually putting our ribs directly in the fire. Now, I'm gonna be using a triple layer of tin foil to wrap these ribs. Let's get started on that process. Now, the ribs come off and they go into a double layered bottom of tin foil. We curl up the sides. And what we're doing is really creating a pocket that's gonna house our apple cider vinegar and our beer. Most important part of any cook, I guess, is uh, uh, the test taste. Test taste? Taste test? <laughs> it's one or the other. Uh, passes inspection. Now we're gonna be using a two parts to one concoction of Coors Light to apple cider vinegar. Pour directly into the bottom of the pan. And about half of what's remaining will be used for the second set of ribs. Apple cider vinegar in. This apple cider vinegar is really nice. It's gonna add some sweetness. That vinegar is really gonna help break things down. Now the reason that we braise meats like this is we wanna break down those really tough tendons and the connective tissues that exist in cuts of meat like ribs. Do the same thing for short ribs as an example. You do the same thing with pork shoulder as an example. We cook up to a certain temperature and then we wrap it. We place a liquid in the bottom of that wrap and we allow that meat to slowly cook in a shallow liquid until it's reached its appropriate internal temperature. Now that cooking in a shallow liquid is braising. Last layer of foil over the top. This is just gonna seal in all the juicy goodness. It's not difficult to see why this is such an adventurous, ambitious cook. We have about three and a half hours now to wait for those ribs to come up to temperature. But listen, in your backyard alone, this cook would be ridiculous. We're just doing it here in the middle of the mountains. We're dealing with fire, we're dealing with wind, we're dealing with ridiculous cold, but I'm super excited to see how these things finish out. I'd love to know what you guys think. Have you ever done a cook like this before? If you have, comment down below. Otherwise, stay tuned, because uh, I'm gonna give you a good reason to never use your smoker in your backyard again. All right, the sear portion of our cook with the ribs is complete. We've just wrapped them, and it's time to get them in the fire. Now, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna continue to build the fire in the center area of the grate. The wrapped ribs are going directly into the fire pit on the floor alongside the fire that we're building. Now to create an oven-like or smoker-like effect. We're taking these river rocks, these flat river rocks, and then we're placing them around the fire table and above the fire table to encapsulate that heat. Now the braising process is one of which meat cooks in a low, uh, shallow liquid for a long period of time. We have in here our beer, our apple cider vinegar, They've been wrapped in the tin foil. They're gonna sit in here for about three to four hours to slowly come up to about 203 degrees of internal temperature. Every 30 minutes, we're gonna turn the ribs 180 degrees. And the intent of doing that is making sure that all portions of the ribs have fair access to the heat being generated by the fire. All right, now for our Pacific Northwest inspired barbecue sauce. We're actually doing a huckleberry style of barbecue sauce. Let's check out the ingredients. Now our sauce starts out with sauteing red onion and roasted garlic in olive oil. Next, we're gonna add in our ketchup, our Dijon mustard, tomato paste, paprika, ancho chili powder, cumin, a bit of our barbecue rub from earlier in the cook, along with black peppercorn, apple cider vinegar, and bourbon. First step, I need half of a red onion. Gonna cut straight through from snout to tail. Now I'm gonna start by removing the tip and I'm leaving the root end of the vegetable. Now for this, I'm gonna make slices across the onion all the way down. About four of them will do just nicely. We then move down the onion and this is gonna be a very fine mince, but this is an easy way to get a fairly even dice on the front end, and then we'll go down through. Down through and across, and you can see we just get these really nice 
diced onions and we're only looking for about a half. In fact, because it's a larger onion, that's about all we need. Now for the mince. I'm just gonna hold my index finger at the top of this blade and just run it directly down and through these onions. In just a moment, you're gonna see the fine mints that we're looking for. Now, I think we actually have a little more onion than we suspected here. We're gonna only use about half of this, and I'm working this onion down to be about the same size as our minced garlic. Heavy bottom sauce pot over the fire. Next in, olive oil. What a heavy bit of olive oil in here. This is both gonna serve to help saute the onion. It's also gonna provide a great base for our barbecue sauce. About two to three tablespoons in the bottom of that pan. Once it's warmed, we'll then place in the onion and the garlic. The olive oil is ready. Look how viscous and smoothly it moves around the bottom of that pot. Onion in. Garlic. Now we built our stone oven in a way that allows us to accomplish two things. Number one, we're able to smoke and slowly cook our ribs, but we've left an open space directly in the center of the grate where we can continue to grill. This is where we're gonna prepare our sauce. We're just gonna cook this down for about 10 minutes. I want the onion well caramelized, the garlic beautiful and fragrant, and all a nice golden color. Cooking outside is kind of like working with just what you have. And we have wind, we have some sunshine, we have plenty of cold, uh, and we have copious amount of rocks. So listen, as the wind rips through, it's cooling the exterior of our pan, making it really difficult to saute. So we're taking our river rock, placing them against the exterior of our pot, and using this one to warm the sides of the pot, but also, <laughs> Also to press all of the smoke directly into camera guy's face. <laughs> but what we're doing is protecting the wind from getting to the side of that pan and cooling it down, that pot and cooling it down uh, and really keeping the temperature in that pot super high. All right, three, two, one. Onion, caramelized, garlic, beautiful, fragrant, all looking golden and delicious. It's time to get the remainder of the ingredients in. Next up, bourbon. Bourbon in. Okay, bourbon really in. <laughs> now I'm gonna get a little shake on this. Watch this here, fire coming in. Flambe inside the pan. We're just burning off the alcohol one more time, ready? You can see the fire literally in the pot. One, two, three, bourbon in. Now we have fire in the pot. What we're doing is we're just burning off the alcohol and we're maintaining all that really cool flavor from the bourbon. Not bad. Nice part about this, there's still about uh, half the bourbon left. Ah, camera guy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next up, apple cider vinegar. About a tablespoon. Beauty. It's gonna add some really nice tanginess inside of that sauce. Ketchup, in. Ketchup does what ketchup does. It's gonna add some really nice sugars, a little tomato-ness, tomato-ness, is that how you pronounce that? Yeah. <laughs> whatever, to, whatever ketchup does, that's what ketchup did. Now as each of these ingredients are going in, I'm stirring along the way to make sure they're well combined. Okay, so we continue to stir. We don't want to let any component of this burn, uh, but we continue to move along. Next is tomato paste, and that's just gonna thicken up the sauce a little bit. Awesome, here we go. Tomato paste in about two and a half, tablespoons in to go with our singular cup of ketchup. Now again, stirring to combine. Next, we're gonna go with Dijon mustard. Uh, Dijon mustard, as they say in live fire circles. Ah, there we go, beauty. Uh, continue to combine and stir well. We're gonna follow that up next with a bit of huckleberry jam. Huckleberry jam in. Beauty. This is really gonna sweeten things up. To me, this brings home a traditional 
style of homemade barbecue sauce and just puts kind of a Pacific Northwest spin on it. It's gonna be great. Really sweet, rich, flavorful. And now for the spice. We're gonna do the chili, paprika, and the ground cumin. In. I'm gonna continue the stir process and because I'm old, I need to stand up regularly to make sure the old hip flexors, knee joints and everything continue to work well after this cook. And finally, our barbecue rub. Boom. Just about a tablespoon. And now we're gonna thin out the rest of the sauce with the rest of the beer we had from earlier in the cook. Beer. <laughs> All right. There you go. A little extra beer never hurt anyone and that's gonna cook down. What a really nice thin sauce, but adding a little extra beer here is gonna really help us concentrate these flavors. This is gonna be great reduced over the top of those ribs. It's important to know with your sauce as it continues to reduce, it's also going to continue to intensify in its flavors. So be cautious to over season too early in your process and before that sauce is finished. Now we're gonna move our sauce just to the side atop our rocks. It's time to prepare our grilled potato salad. And I can't wait to show you how we do this. Now alongside the ribs, we're doing a grilled potato salad. For your grilled potato salad, you're gonna need two key ingredients. One, potatoes. We're using russet. You can use Yukon, you can use red potatoes. You can frankly use whatever kind of potato you need. Secondarily, skewers. What we're gonna do is we're gonna chop these russet potatoes into eighths, and then we're gonna skewer them, cover them in olive oil, salt, pepper, garlic, and we're gonna get them over the fire, char them up, and then we have an incredible sauce that we're gonna toss them in for our grilled potato salad. Now our potatoes have already been rinsed and cleaned. We're just gonna slice lengthwise easy through the potato, turn it directly over one more time, down through the middle, and then across. We're gonna repeat this process for each of our potatoes. We have about a half dozen potatoes to prepare in the same exact fashion. All right, the beauty of this recipe is in its simplicity. Uh, the complicity, is that it? If it's complicated, is it complicity? I don't think that's a word. You don't think it is? Okay, for now it's a word. The complicity of this recipe is making sure you don't stab yourself in the middle of the woods with no resources around uh, to repair you. Uh, but just take the skewer, place it directly through the potato and work it down. Uh, it's important when you're doing skewers of any kind uh, whether it's a protein and veggie skewer or otherwise, uh, to leave some space between each of the items so they can all cook properly. Uh, there's no right and wrong way to this. The only right way is just to not stab yourself. And before the seasoning, this is what we're looking for. Edward potato hands. Drizzling the olive oil atop the potatoes and next, hitting them up with the salt, pepper, and garlic. Our seasoning rub for the potato is three parts kosher salt to one part ground black peppercorn to a half part roasted granulated garlic. Potatoes well seasoned and now going directly over the fire. Nice sizzle. Now those potatoes, are gonna be on there for about six to eight minutes per side. They're gonna take about 15 minutes or so to cook. We have a low rolling fire at the moment, so we're integrating smoke, building some char, and lots of flavor. Okay, we've just turned our potatoes for the first time, and that's what we're looking for. Again, every four to six minutes, we're gonna to continue to turn, we're gonna to continue to work around the potato until it's completely cooked through and fork tender. I think the beauty of this recipe is in its simplicity. And when I say that, I mean, these are ingredients that you can find whether in your pantry at your home, at the grocery store, or simply by just hiking out about uh, through the woods. Uh, that being said, this sauce is no different. We're using easy, simple ingredients, but when put together are greater as a whole than they are individually. I'll show you what I mean. Our sauce begins with chopping our parsley and juicing a lemon. Just gonna put 
a rough chop on the parsley, just working our way through. We're gonna come back again with one more cut, going deep and clean through the leaves of the parsley. We do not want the stem. Back through one more time. <laughs> Thank you, wind. <laughs> All right, here we go. Wind in the mountains. That's what you deal with when you're cooking outside. Everything blows around. It's part of the game. There we go. All right, clean up. Foot moves off the board. All right, before it flies into the river, it goes into our bowl. There we go. Get rid of the rest. Now for the lemon, you're gonna need three items. Number one, a massive Pacific Northwest lemons. I've never seen lemons like this. We don't have lemons in the Pacific Northwest. Where do you get these things from? Uh, they probably come from like Argentina. Okay, <laughs> okay. Three items you're gonna need for the lemon is, well one, lemons, two, very sharp knife, and uh, my personal knuckle scraper. Uh, this is actually my zester, but we're gonna juice half the lemon and we're gonna zest the rest. Lemon juice directly over the parsley, hand below with hopes of catching the seeds that come from the lemon. Did we get lucky? Any seeds? No. Nice. All right, flipping it over, and now we're gonna zest the lemon. We just want the zest, which is the exterior component here of the lemon. Let's see how much zest we can get from this process. What we don't want is we don't want the rind. And I'm not sure with the lighting how well you can see the differentiation between the zest and the rind, but the zest is this beautiful yellow component here. The rind is the whiter component directly in this space here. We do not want the rind. Oh! We have a seed! A seed escaped! Oh. Ready? Great. Okay. Potatoes. <laughs> Potatoes are done. They have a really nice char around the exterior of all component. They have a really nice. They have a really nice char around the exterior of. Yeah. Run the exterior. Okay. Three, two, one. <laughs> all right. Potatoes are done. They have a beautiful char that's been developed. It's time to get them off the skewer and toss them in the sauce. Uh, go potato. There we go. Next one. Go potatoes. Nice. Boom. Last one. Get in there, potatoes. Oh, it's clean. All right, the base to any great potato salad, if you ask me, Duke's mayo super creamy. It's going to elevate a bit of tanginess to this dish. Here we go. Creamy mayo goes in. Now we're going to get these ingredients in one at a time. We'll wait and stir them all together at the end. There's not too much of a science to this portion of the process. Next, Dijon mustard. The Dijon is really going to create a great bit of contrast and add a bit of spiciness, in fact, to this sauce. Next, Roasted minced garlic. When you roast garlic, particularly over a fire, it develops a really beautiful buttery flavor. W sauce, the umami of sauces in. Red wine vinegar. Now this is elevating the tang in any sauce. Now just a couple tablespoons of red onion. This is a fine dice on the red onion. Now a local caramelized wildflower honey. This combination of sweet, salty, savory with a little punch of heat, it's gonna be delicious. <clears throat> now to finish, kosher salt in black peppercorn. Now lightly season. And that's all we need. A glug of olive oil never hurt anyone, so um, here we go. Glug, 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 glug. I think it was like four or five glugs. That wasn't one glug, that was like four or five. Okay, stir. Look at that sauce. That smells really good. That's great. 
So we're gonna stir, we're gonna hit it hard with the stir. I'm gonna get a little taste on this just to make sure the seasoning's right. And then we're gonna toss it in the potatoes. So here we go. That's not bad. Camera guy taste test. <laughs> that's really good. Yeah, that's not bad, right? And so when I said each of the ingredients individually are better together as a whole, I mean, we have a combination of umami, we have sweetness, saltness, we have some tanginess, we have some good contrast, some good, what do we call it, like, complicity? I don't even know it, I'm losing my words. It's freezing, I'm losing my words. It's just friggin' delicious. So in, here we go. All right, here we go, sauce in. Now just use your hands just to toss the salad about, that onion, the herbs, all that tangy umami flavor, just get it rolling around in here. It's gonna be amazing, sided up by those ribs. If there's one thing I can't stress enough, it's that we cook to temperature, not to time. Uh, yes, I believe it's gonna take three to four hours by maintaining uh, the fire at its current consistency, uh, but it may take less, it may take more. Uh, now to determine temperature, I use an internal digital read thermometer. Uh, I don't, for steaks or pork or chicken, I don't touch my face to determine tenderness. You see these guys on TV do all the time. I don't do this thing by uh, touching my hands. Frankly, it doesn't work. And then touching the meat and touching your face and your hands is just, it's gross. So get a digital read thermometer. We're gonna plug it here into these ribs. We're gonna check it intermittently. And when they're ready and the thermometer says, the thermometer, <laughs> the thermometer says we're ready to go, that's when the ribs come off. Uh, I'll tell you, <clears throat> um, three hours with your buddies in the middle of the mountains, in the middle of nowhere, fishing in a place like this, it's gotta be uh, at least in part what it's all about, you know? So we're, um, we're back now at the campsite and it's time to eat. <laughs> we're starving. Um, it's been an awesome afternoon uh, with Alex and with Brian, uh, but it's time to eat. So uh, what we're gonna do, ribs are up to temperature. Uh, they have been cooking in our modified stone oven. Uh, as you can see, we had to apply more rocks than expected around our fire, but we have this super rad bushcraft oven that's not only being heated, by the timber in the center, but all of these rocks now are just radiating that heat. Really cool stuff. Uh, that being said, it's time to get rid of those rocks, pull the racks of ribs from their tin foil, and start saucing them up. It's just about time to eat. Bring it. Oh, that is hot. That one's warm. There's no way we would have finished this cook without these rocks. Completely ridiculous to propose doing this cook, by the way, on a day like this. I think at its high, it was like, what, like 34, 35? Super cold, ridiculous winds. But thank God the sun's been shining the entire time. All right, moment of truth. Ribs are coming out, uh, and this is kind of like uh, show and tell time, right? Did we do the job or not? Oh, oh, they're pliable. Oh, here we go. Get them out. Come on. Here we go. Oh, I think that that could put, that's potentially a good sign. That's potentially a good sign. There's some liquids in there. All right, moment of truth. Whoa, whoa, look at that. Whoa, you cannot CGI that. You can't CGI it, you can't do it. Look at that, and then look at these teeth pulling back from the sides. That is exactly what we're looking for, exactly what we're looking for. Teeth pulling back, meat moving up. These things are so ready to go, so ready to go. Now the next step in this process, ribs are at about 195 at the moment. We're gonna build up the fire one last time, get it ripping hot. We're gonna grill the ribs to finish. 
but we're gonna just baste them and build layer upon caramelized layer of that Huckleberry barbecue. This is gonna be epic. That looks so good. Now this brushing, and the brushing the ribs is really the art form of this. So we're gonna build the fire. I'm just gonna let the tack build on this, let it begin to settle in. But we're gonna do this probably three to four times on each side of the rib and really build out a deeply caramelized layer of barbecue sauce. Whew. That fire is ripping. That's what we want though. The fire is ripping. In the last five to seven minutes of this cook, we're just gonna continually layer upon layer this Huckleberry bourbon barbecue sauce. One layer after another. All oh, that smoky, amazing goodness. Look at those ribs. This honestly is turning out so matter. This is turning out so much better than we had planned. I planned on perfection. Me too, yeah. Yeah, you guys had very high expectations. We also decided to barbecue ribs in a pile of stones <laughs> in the middle of a mountain. Here we go, let's go another layer. We'll kind of double up, there's nothing wrong with that. I think we've reached the all-in juncture and uh, the commitment level at this point is, is literally wearing these ribs across your face. <laughs> these are so ridiculously, these are so good. What? Look at those ribs just pull back from the bones like this thing is smiling at me. That's what we're looking for. Look at that caramelization. That sauce is just caramelizing all across those ribs. Wow. These ribs are done. This is exactly the color we're looking for. Honest to goodness, I don't think that with a pellet smoker and offset in my backyard, these ribs would have turned out any better. This is so friggin' cool. I am so excited about this. We've hit these up now with three turns directly over the fire, caramelizing one layer after another. They're gonna set for probably about seven to 10 minutes <laughs> if they're lucky, and it's time to smash. Ribs are done, it is time to eat. We have had such a cool day up here, man. Like, oh, yeah. I can't believe like this is honest to goodness, like one of the coolest spots I've ever been, ever cooked anywhere in the world. Uh, and again, you put it, you, you put us right on it, man. Yeah, no, this is a beautiful area. I've been coming up here for over 20 years, and you know, I'm just honored to have you up here and to be able to do something like this that I've never been a part of, and something new for you also. I just can't wait to eat it. <laughs> this is crazy, man. This is one of the most ridiculous cooks I've ever done, and. Uh, now we're about to, to get into it and uh, really find out what we're made of here, man. Yeah, let's get it done, man. All right, let's do it. That's warm. That's really, that's so good looking. There's been enough talk, it's time for some action. We're gonna dive into these ribs. Time to carve. To carve, look at this. Look how, what, what? Look how tender that is. It's literally falling from the bone. What in the world? Look at that, a little assist. Look at the back side and those ribs. What I'm gonna do is just take the knife, I'm gonna carve directly. Look, that's like butter. That's like butter. Ready for this? Look at that. Look how juicy those are. Look at this. Look how juicy those ribs are. That's insane. Back to the knife, back to the knife. I need more. I need more knife rib carving action. This is moving through these literally like butter. Look how juicy those ribs are. That is absolutely amazing. 
These are gonna be so darn good. And I'll tell you guys what, if you guys liked this episode today, make sure to comment down below one and two, smash that subscribe button. Join us on this adventure. We're traveling to literally every single corner of the United States, finding locations just like this and doing crazy cooks. And I want you to be there with us when it happens. This recipe, hundreds more at livefirerepublic.com. Stay hungry, my friends. The bites don't lie. Look at that, straight from the bone. Let's go.